Right. Uh, so welcome to this panel about the English uh, Wikipedia Arbitration Committee. Uh, I am Addison Bryant, otherwise known as Barkeep49, and I am going to be moderating the panel. The idea here is uh, to really have it be responsive to what all is going on in the room. So I am happy. I, I have some prepared questions. I have a longer set of questions that I uh, have in my mind, but really I think the idea from the arbitrators who I'll let introduce themselves in a moment is really to have this be interactive and really hear from you and and just be responsive to what you, what is on your mind, uh, hear thoughts from you, answer questions that might uh, you might have. So uh, I'm gonna uh, pass the mic over to our arbitrators and then uh, if they can kind of introduce themselves and maybe just since the uh, the title of the panel is uh, the arbitration committee, what's happening and where it's going. So uh, maybe if the ARBs is part of their introduction can say one thing that they're thinking of in terms of what's happening at the moment, uh, that would be a, a good way to introduce ourselves to the people in the room and watching elsewhere. So I'll pass it over to Kevin. Have you ever seen that spelling of arbitrators? That's ARBA and then like traders all in all caps. That's that's what I kept thinking when you were introducing us. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. I'm Kevin Lee. This is my uh, L235 on, or on English Wikipedia. Uh, this is my fourth and um, last year on ARBCOM. Um, I don't know. I, I think the thing that continues to be top of mind for me is uh, ARBCOM often, and you're going to hear this, I think, uh, uh, like, you know, this is one of many jobs on Wikipedia that feel like, you know, not quite full time jobs, but like, really demanding. And uh, how, how, how do we support the load of like making these roles plausible to do for someone who, you know, maybe potentially works full time in the world? It's a, it's a big question, and not one that I think we've gotten the answer to. Hi, everybody. My name is Michael. I go by the username I, which is spelt A-O-I-D-H. I don't expect you to pronounce that. Um, and I became an administrator last March, joined ARPCOM this year. Thanks, Money Trees, yeah. for roping me into that. Um, and one thing that's been on my mind lately is how we can improve the speed of our responses and our actions and try to streamline that process. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy. I'm known as Z1720 on Wikipedia. Um, it's my first year on ARPCOM, and the thing that I'm thinking about is editor retention, um, admin retention, um, functionary retention, just trying to, how do we get people to continue to be involved and avoid that burnout that seems to happen on a whole bunch of different levels, and especially seems to happen as the higher up people go with the number of hats they collect, the more likely they are to end up just crashing, burning, and disappearing from the site forever. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Theo West, uh, aka Money Trees. Uh, this is my second year on the committee. And uh, one thing that I'm really thinking about right now is um, the role the committee plays in um, managing uh, disinformation and uh, um, Increasing amount of uh, reports we get to um, offsite queues about pay editing and such, and the ways in which um, we can help assist the community um, kind of deal with this and kind of uh, be almost kind of more transparent uh, in terms of like what we have to deal with and what we see in moderation of the site. So, yeah. uh, great. So, are there any questions in the room? Comments? If not, Happy to keep asking, but really is the idea if you if there's something on your mind, they want to hear it. Marshall. Well, I'm interested in hearing this about like from your perspective. Well, first of all, hi, I'm Marshall from the product manager of the Google Foundation. Well, again, I'm interested in hearing more about this information and how you all kind of classify that. Like what does that term mean? Um, and whether you see like trending up, trending down, like because people talk about it a huge amount in like the global discourse. And uh, from, from my perception, it's like not an affliction that has increased on Wikipedia the way that people talk about increasing on Twitter or in the news or like wherever else. And so I was 
So just in case anyone couldn't hear, Marshall just gave a, a thoughtful explanation and is curious about dis, disinformation and how our ARBs think and approach that. Um, Money, would you like to? Um, well, it's a, I think, really good question. And it's um, something I've thought about, like the, the definition of it in terms of like the way disinformation might be described on like a platform like a, a Twitter or Facebook, I think is... Mm, I think it's a lot different from the way uh, we consider uh, diff information on Wikipedia because, I mean, if you think about it in terms of like ARBCOM's role and uh, AE's role in terms of like certain political points of view and um, uh, thoughts being pushed and like um, kind of, you know, people using underhanded tactics to like promote them. That's something that we've been dealing with for our entire existence through like cases on contentious topic areas and stuff. So. In that sense, I think when it comes to preventing like this kind of um, disinformation concerns you hear about on other websites like uh, uh, what I mentioned earlier, I think that Wikipedia is actually um, very well kind of prepared and we've already had like a very extensive history of dealing with this these kind of issues. Um, I think right now though in terms of like that becoming a bit of a, a bigger um, focus for – Arbcom, or I feel like it's becoming a bigger focus personally. I think it might have to do with Wikipedia's increasing prominence in the world and how, um, I guess, respectability. I think there's more um, actors, uh, independent um, or not, that are interested in skewing the website in a particular way, who, um, whether someone is giving them the resources to like spend all this time trying to maybe rewrite history in a specific way or like uh you know use some sources that may be kind of revisionist or you know kind of push away people that might be um uh kind of anti whatever point of view or whatever this government thinks about what happened like 50 years ago in some conflict um i think uh that's that's something that is becoming uh, more, I think, organized and like focused in terms of um, like the attempts to kind of push and like persuade and like get through certain points of view and such. And I think that goes. I think kind of the obvious example right now for that is um, the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, in terms of like, there's been some um, offsite groups that are really interested in. Um, uh, on like both sides, all different sorts of points of view and stuff, like pushing what they think should happen on these articles because uh, we're not we're not telling the truth or whatever. Um, uh, but I think it goes beyond that too, just in terms of like um, a lot of these. Like I think a lot of the next few um, uh, uh, ARB cases on uh, like contentious topic areas, uh, even like this uh, Yasuke one right now, which I guess is kind of like GamerGate uh, one point two or 1.1 1 .1. but uh a lot of that's going to come down to like these people who are very closely coordinated and kind of like working in tandem with each other to push a view but it's more than just like it might be more than just like they're exchanging emails and stuff it, it might be a lot more than that it might be like these people are really like putting in the time to push whatever point of view so uh i hope that kind of answered question not just that like you can tell this is pretty organized this is like yeah to like yeah like get through what they want and i think like the, the disinformation i think it might be more like kind of pov pushing and like uh misuse of sources and kind of like stuff that you know it might appear appear more subtle uh in terms of like what is considered disinformation on like uh x or facebook where it's just like like content farm seo trash like pushing out like stories and like like drilling into the minds of like um, teenagers in America by like referencing Kai Sinat and Aiden Ross in their headlines and like uh, fake rap TV headlines. So I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking about. But <laughs> I, I got a show of hands, by the way. Who, who here who here knows that our pod works on disinformation? Oh yeah, raise your hand. If you we'll disinformation Information stuff. Like oh, actually, you know, honestly, you know like better than I expected. I, I don't actually know if people know about. Um, the WMF, they have a uh, disinformation task force now. Uh, I don't know how many people know about that, but they've been very helpful in, um, or they've provided us with some very interesting resources in our um, 
uh, interactions with them, in my opinion. So, so maybe, maybe you can up. follow that up. So do you want to kind of maybe discuss how does ARPCON interact then with the foundation and talk about that that relationship and partnership? Yeah, so um, we have regular meetings with the WMF, usually about once a month, uh, where we have an hour to talk with various um, various people who are with the foundation about some of the issues that are happening, um, not just within English Wikipedia, but across the many different projects, because we know that um, with the growth of the projects, we don't just see people who are only acting on English Wikipedia, but they are adding images onto commons and then using that to provide disinformation, or they are trying to update things on many different language projects in order to fit with their own point of view that um, creates, that is problematic. So by having these meetings, we're able to exchange that information and also to discuss um, concerns that the community has brought to us um, towards the greater organization and try to find some of those solutions so that we can keep um, the project moving forward in that positive way and um, in a place where um, everyone is able to edit the site, which is the goal of why we're all here in the first place is the number one goal is to create this encyclopedia. Um, Kevin, did you want to, or... I, I actually did want to point out something. Um, Disinformation is a form of misinformation that has the goal of influencing people's actions, thoughts, uh, how they perceive things. And a lot of times the goal isn't just to uh, share false information, but it's also to erode the trust in an opposing viewpoint that might have, you know, validity. They can't directly refute it, so they're just going to make it they're going to muddy the waters and make it questionable. So you don't, you're not sure where to go to. And that's a lot of times their goals. And that's more insidious because a lot of times there is a valid point to questioning the validity of information. So I just wanted to point that out. It's not just false information. Sometimes it's making things questionable. Our creation committee charter is supposed to be editor behavior not editor's content, you're not the editorial board. Aren't you in a gray zone when you're dealing with disinformation? It's kind of like the intersection yeah. between behavior and content. Yeah, I, I, yeah. honestly, this is, um, I, I guess this is why I wanted to ask who who is aware that, you know, our, um, a, a, you know, a significant part of our time is spent on disinformation these days, because that's a valid question, right? You know, our comms mandate is principally to, uh, you know, handle uh, conduct disputes. Oh, well, Freudian slip there. Um, and, you know, here we are working on um, working on all this other stuff. And a couple of things I'll say on that. Um, first off, you know, there's, uh, I guess our has always existed in a kind of gray zone where the application of the conduct rules requires, um, you know, r requires evaluating, for example, whether people are um, like straight up misrepresenting sources, for example, which is a question that sometimes has content implications. But, you know, m more broadly, I think we should be worried whenever, or like worried, mm. one of the reasons why this is a particularly taxing area of work is that this is somewhere where, you know, our, our comms mandate is principally to do these, like, um, theoretically, these cases, and then, like, we have special, you know, uh, exceptional mandates to work on, like, private information. But, you know, the exception has kind of swallowed the rule in the sense that um, y responding to, you know, coordinated mass disinformation is really hard for an open project. Uh, to do where you know everything is publicly posted, and um, and uh, that that's really sort of why Arbcom has gotten into the business, and also why Arbcom is so incredibly stretched thin here, right? Like there, I don't think we follow up most of the things that we feel like we yeah. would like to, um, and uh, this is one of those things where. I am concerned about sort of the long-term future of whether we have the capacity even to be handling, you know, e even a small fraction of what the community ultimately has assigned us, which is to um, investigate all of the things that have to be um, the, in which there are non-public elements, um, which is a huge undertaking and uh, not something that uh, in, our, in our current structure we have the capacity to do. 
um, meaningfully. Okay. Oh. Yeah, money, money wanted to bring. Oh yeah, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, so like we will never say this is the text that should be in an article. Right. That is like a hard line, but a lot, the content that is in the article sometimes is a reflection of the conduct that has happened on talk pages or that people have posted. And the content is the, is the result of the conduct. And so when we look at how are the, some of the editors, what they're adding onto the site, we can say this editor has, is, keeps putting on, uh, their own POV that is inappropriate and is causing disruption. And at the end of the day, that's what ARBCOM is really trying to solve is how do we end these disruptions that are happening in various places throughout the site that the community as an individual capacity or in one individual administrator or RFCs or the administrator notice board has not been able to solve because there has been so much discussion around it or um, nobody is willing to go into that topic area, and then we take that on. And the result is we we limit some people to be able to edit the site. We um, ask other people to um, have discussions before things are added. So that way, the content that then gets added to the site is the best that we can put forward and that we can get the most amount of information going forward. So oh, maybe we can do it. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, uh, a clay oh, look, if we could oh. maybe do a quick uh, whip around to build off something Kevin was talking about. We have oh, a yeah. question from a viewer remotely saying, I curious see. in any given month, what is the range of hours that you spend on our common duties? And oh, then maybe we can do a quick oh, shit. That and oh. the question. Oh, that's, let's see. Um, uh, let's see. I would say, like, at my peak it was around like two and a half hours an hour two and a half hours uh but i would say like oh oh in a day so uh so um hmm. uh, actually i think on a lot of slower days it will be like 30 to 45 minutes it won't be too bad uh we actually a big thing we did this year was cut down on appeals uh from check user blocks so now a lot of those are happening uh, on wiki and that like really really honestly that was like a ton of most of the workload from arpcoms for the last few years so i think that's done some stuff but yeah um arpcom is a place where um you wait for the fire to come to you so there'll be some days where not much is going on i can like read through the discussion that's happening in like 15 minutes and then the something will land in our lap and we need to figure out what's going on and i have to book off time that week on a specific day of, okay, I'm going to have to spend 10 hours reading through this evidence. I better make sure that I'm ready to go. Um, or, um, you know, this appeal has jumped to our lap and what's going on with this. So it, it's, it's, it, it's also like, depends on how much time you want to put in. Like I had my vacation in August, so I was able to work on drafting a case. I'm now back at work, so I'm not going to be drafting the next case. Um, you get to make that decision. Yeah, a lot of what we do is really reactionary, so it really depends on what's going on. Sometimes I'm, I've am i only spent an hour on ARPCOM. Sometimes if I'm compiling case evidence, like private evidence, it's six hours. It just really depends on, you know, what's happening and what we need to do that day. I, th I think that's about right. Um, I think that uh, you're sampling mostly from my first two and a half years on ARPCOM, um, I, I think that it would probably be reasonable to say that an average, like a reasonable average is 10 hours a week. Um, maybe maybe sometimes significantly more, though it, it does spike. I think at a, as a broader point, um, I don't want to scare anyone off from running for ARBCOM. This is a this is a really important role, and it is not as bad often as people like make it out to be. Um, the thing that is, uh, I, I think on, on time commitments, um, it's hard to get caught back up is um, is something that I've learned, right? Like, I think that if you are, if you take a few weeks off from reading the emails, which don't do that, um, there's no, it's, it's impossible. Um, if you like, it, 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 once you are a little bit behind, I think it, it, 
it's like being in school, you know, and you, um, and you're, you take like your, your few weeks behind on, on things. And then all of a sudden everything else crashes into you. Um, so I think that it can, I think, take more time to get caught. Like, it, I mean, I guess this is pretty obvious stuff. Um, 10 hours a week, I think is pretty reasonable. Let's take your oh. question. I mean, we we usually focus on the behavioral aspect. It's, I would, uh, I would say, there. It's it's kind of, it's not really that complicated, I guess. It's um, they're more in kind of like an ad like advising role so let's say we have like a a case on this one particular contentious topic area they don't like send us info they don't really send us information about like this person like oh like you should block so and so but uh they might like provide us with um a document or like some information about like um uh s stuff within the area to maybe like help us kind of understand the dispute more in the history behind things so uh, uh, for example, when, uh, during the Poland case last year, um, they, uh, actually, um, made a table of, uh, the sources that were, um, cited in, uh, one of the, uh, the journal article that kind of started that off and, um, kind of assess them up among, uh, what academics think about these sources and like these particular claims in different parts about it. So that was something that was kind of like, um, a useful advising thing to us um and they've done other stuff like that too just like kind of provide like this is what the consensus of scholars and like sources is on this topic from like what we know and what our experts and they provide stuff to us like that there's been um one or no no not really um i wouldn't really yeah they were really they haven't really provided us with information that has led us to blocking people they've provided us with information that will indicate to us that they're going to maybe be blocking or banning someone on a global scale and it might be disinformation related um but they're not i don't i can't really remember like a time where like they're like oh uh you know like there, here's some stuff about so-and-so and you can like you know knock them off for us but Any other comments kind of on the scale of the, i mean because i think that was really the heart of your question is what's the scale of disinformation that's happening I, I, I not not too much in that way, but sometimes stuff also flows the other way where we're saying, hey, we've got this disinformation thing or something's happening for conduct, but it also like they've said they've edited on this these other two language um, Wikipedias. So that's outside of our scope. We're only in English Wikipedia. So we're bringing it to the WMF to say like who, which is the group that needs to go forward. We also have some conduct stuff that we cannot, um, it's not within our scope because it's legal ramifications or um, the problem is just too big for us to be able to solve on our own. So we bring it to them and we have that back and forth. They also are very good about telling us like, we're seeing like this huge event has happened in the world and we think that stuff might hit the fan in English Wikipedia. So we want you to be aware. And so that way you can start prepping like when, like, um, when Palestine, Israel stuff was happening and they're like, we, we see what kind of stuff is starting to pop up across all of the sister sites. Um, we could start preparing for it so that when the, our, like the case requests have came in um, the earlier this year, we were not like completely shocked and had to start from scratch. So uh, very briefly on the numbers, um, I think the stuff that's public is that um, I think it's probably fewer than 20 ARBCOM blocks in a year, just like across all categories, right? Um, and that's inclusive of a few different... I mean, that may understate it somewhat in that, um, like, the, the line between an ARBCOM block, which is something that you need a majority of the committee to sign off on.
uh, um, taking in this information, like taking in information, and then um, you know, developing enough of a record that doesn't that rely. Is, uh, developing enough of a record. Um, so that they could issue check user blocks in their individual capacity based on leads from, you know, people emailing us ARBCOM stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I guess that this is illustrating the broader point, which is that it's so, it's so person dependent, right? Uh, that person is no, no longer on the committee. And so those investigations don't happen nearly as much anymore because we just don't have the capacity to do them. One thing I do want to point out though, is it's not like we're taking direction from the WMF. Sometimes, and it goes both ways. Sometimes we're like, hey, we just want to put this on your radar. Um, and sometimes they send us stuff and we're like, that's not really something we need to do right now, if at all. Uh, so that's that's actually interesting. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, there's actually one particular case that uh, you said that that um, was there. Like that's it really kind of aligned with what was happening in that case where they told us about. There's this one. I, I guess I can. I, I think I can be vague about this. Yeah. There's just one. There's just one person that were like, oh, this person. They're in a contentious topic area, and they have uh, like this kind of. They're posting these particular sources. And these aren't their reliable sources. They're really, like biased towards one side, but they also have a um, conflict of interest with these sources uh, because they like work very closely with like these networks and stuff. And uh, they told us this, and they later um, they like dealt with this person. Um, so I guess that was kind of an example of. Um, I guess if if that kind of answers your question in terms of like uh, the foundation has. Uh, its own limitations in terms of uh, yeah. both policy and legally around its ability to influence content. Yeah. Um, right. So from policy perspective, they very, I mean, philosophically, they believe that content should be editor created. And then because as a U.S. nonprofit, and Brian, I'm looking for you to give me a bad, <laughs> a bad, a bad nod. Oh, wait, I just want to make here, one point. As a U.S. nonprofit, right? There's um, getting involved in certain ways um, opens them up to different levels of accountability than if volunteers are making those decisions. And so uh, by not posting it directly, they are made, they're kind of giving themselves a, a clear legal safe, safe, uh, safe harbor around other editorial decisions that are getting made. I also think if they say that, like, here are some sources that might be problematic, that might put an inappropriate amount of weight on that opinion, because that's still an opinion. Editors might disagree. Like, the WMF might say, this is not a reliable source, but the editing community says, yes, it is. So them saying that might put a disproportionate weight on that opinion. I think is maybe part of that reason in addition to that. And, and let me just say, there are no cases where it's like, you know, these sources are suspicious. And so anyone who uses these sources is a suspicious person. That That's not, I, I guess that's, um, uh, that that is not what is coming. Uh, um, I think there's limits to how, <clears throat> sorry, there is some limit to how much we can discuss this with specificity. Um, I think, we can assure you that it's not like we are not making we're not like we're not trying to backdoor you know content decisions with the conduct de uh, decisions here there um the 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 source analysis for example is um contextual and not you know it's not like a direct <laughs> um we're, we're we're getting the people who are going to use the bad sources i know you've been waiting uh, on the question oh It'd be better if there was either like a paid coordinator person because like the foundation has been like I think there's one or two committees now that have like a paid facilitator that is not like a, a voting member of the committee, you know, but like there is someone who is just job to make sure things don't get dropped. And like what it kind of sounded like you were saying is that like there's not enough people hours to do it. And like there are things that are getting too hard from that do get dropped. And I'm wondering if like staffing yeah, and paying people. Kevin, this is something you've thought about for a long time. Yeah, I, I, I would love to be able to. I, I think that I've been beating the drum of like we should hire someone for a few years now. Um, 
I think in short that having someone whose responsibility is to, you know, keep track of what all the balls are in the air uh, and like make sure that we're not dropping them is uh, very useful. That said, I feel like the staff committee, like the committees that get foundation staff support sometimes themselves like then stagnate and activity um, like in the in the movement more generally and uh, and sometimes sometimes those committees can end up more staff run than staff advised. So there's some balance. Uh, yeah, um, this is just something I was thinking about earlier. Um, it actually has been something I think about for like the past year or so in terms of like kind of dealing with uh, these kind of issues and making sure they don't like drop off a face of a cliff into our like the dark archives. Um, I think that I think this committee, uh, well, the committee over the last few years has been kind of slowly giving more of our functions away to uh, the community in some regards in terms of like uh, check user blocks, for example, now like a uh, you know, check users can review that. They don't need to go to us to be appealed. Um, and also like the COI and uh, paid queues and, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, conflict of interest. And <laughs> uh, by the way, if anyone went to uh, Annie's um, talk and discussion last night, she talked about how uh, she like flipped out when she heard someone call it COI for the first time. Uh, she was referring to a conversation she had with me. So, uh, I, I still I, I still like calling it coy but um anyways uh the right the okay yeah the the queues uh which were opening to um admins who aren't just functionaries um uh that's like another um that they can look at like private evidence through that and such that's another way we're kind of opening um uh like some of our functions back to the community in some ways uh, I think that in terms of like making sure things don't fall off a cliff and also so that like, well, I think it comes down to the fact that uh, Wikipedia, I mean, it's it's an institution of the Internet uh, at this point. It's it's 20 years old. It's it's an old website. And, uh, you know, a lot of these policies and um, are like not just policies, but like our processes and everything. They were like written when we were a lot smaller and we didn't have the statue and standing in the world that we do now. And we aren't, you know, this giant kind of sprawling thing uh so i think that um you know we're gonna we're gonna see uh arbcom over like the next few years kind of like changing our role and stuff and like how we kind of interact with um the rest of the kind of the management of the site uh and the admins and the wmf in terms of like kind of spreading the workload more evenly and best addressing like the issues that the site faces uh which includes a lot of like a lot of increasing like offsite uh, canvassing and disinformation um, and misinformation and just like nonsense type stuff. Um, uh, Cause like, I would say like, actually um, you were asking earlier about how many like blocks we did at the direction of WMF. We, I don't feel like we never really did anything like that, but we did do a lot on our own terms of like, Oh, this person is like doing a bunch of canvassing offsite. Like they're posting a ton on Twitter to like get people to like brigade on a vote or something uh, and et cetera there's a lot of cases of stuff like that happening or like discord or like, Oh, these people, like they accidentally revealed that they were like emailing each other to like uh brigade at AE or something. So we would block people like <clears throat> off of that kind of stuff. So, but I think um to kind of one thing I've been thinking of um to kind of maybe unify things a bit more is um uh, giving admins at AE or other places uh, access to some of the information that the WMF has provided us uh, when it comes to disinformation type efforts and stuff. Um, and maybe some sort of advisory positions on that. Uh, and maybe opening it up so that like, I don't know, it's easier maybe for AE admins to get an idea of what's happening offsite in terms of like, who's canvassing for what and like, who's like brigading these people to like go do and vote on these certain things and offsite disruption like that. So, um, yeah, I hope that kind of answered like those questions. Arbitrator burnout. Oh, sorry. Um, arbit arbitrator burnout is a real, uh, thing. And we see a lot. I was looking at it, um, last night of the arbitrators when they left the committee, how much they, um, interact with the site after they leave. And, some of them stick around. I'd say about a third of them drifted away where they have like less than 100 edits a month afterwards. And some of them just stopped editing the site altogether. And arbitrators tend to be some of the most skilled 
and experienced people of some of the processes on the site. Like CCI, Ted was basically rebuilt that, ran it, and then went on arbitration and had, could do less work on there because th they ran out of time. Um, and we have some of that other ones on there where they're like former clerks, they were doing a lot of stuff and then they got on to arbitration and they can't do as much clerking anymore. And then if we burn out some of those people who have the most knowledge, who are the people that are coming up behind to be able to continue that process is going, um, they end up going down. So do we wanna have paid staff? Maybe if it allows arbitrators to then um, not get those feelings of burnout. And the other side of it is when we, like when we pulled out Ted out of CCI and they did less work onto there, that happens all the time with like other arbitrators where we're pulling out some of our best members to not be able to edit onto the site. Like my, the amount of featured articles I'm able to do has dropped. The amount of, of uh, featured articles that I'm able to work on and save significantly dropped. And that was what I was doing before I got onto the committee. So um, how do we make it so that arbitrators can spend less time doing some of the tasks behind the scenes and more time building the encyclopedia? I've been curious about is, um, as you know, I am a minority on the English Wikipedia. Um, I often work with communities that don't feel like they can run to a, um, not even to just our normal admins, even to arbitrators with, let's say, <coughs> excuse me, with regards to issues that are internal communities, that our own communities deal with. For example, I don't think a lot of Filipino Wikipedians, if they run into trouble or something, they will run to, let's say, the arbitration committee, or they were. They would rather run to um, administrators like myself because we are weeded in the local affairs of these communities. And so, I'm curious to hear your thoughts as to whether or not this is going. Um, let me. I'm going to try to formulate the question like this. I'm curious to hear whether or not this is going to eventually be a problem. Because you have, for example, like for me, we end up shortcutting other admins when it comes to making administrative decisions on Wikipedia because our communities don't feel like they can run normal English Wikipedia community structures when it comes to, oh, we need something done immediately, they just rather run to us. And do you folks see this as a potential problem, especially if we're dealing with a large, with all due respect to, my, to everyone here, you know, there aren't a lot of people that work with communities from outside the United States in this right in this session. So I'm curious to hear how that would work, given that we do have a large chunk of editors from the Philippines, from India, from Nigeria, and so on and so forth, and they have very little to co-interaction with the arbitration committee or with any other, you know, formal community structure that we have on the English Wikipedia. Our com does not move fast. And that is something that I think um I'd like more member members of the community to know that. We um, we take larger problems and we spend a lot of time deliberating on the best thing to do to solve systematic issues onto the site. So for some of those issues that you might bring forward where they need a fast response, I would tell them to go to you because you would be able to be able to do at least a short term solution and then potentially bring it to us. We also need um, other leadership structures where knowledgeable editors like you who of community members can go to initially um, can come to you and then you can also help them approach ARBCOM. You can be like that link between those editors and with us. Um, so that way we can um, get a better understanding of what's going on. Because I'm not a member of every single community that can exist on Wikipedia. And I don't know some of the nuances that are going in there. And when we get cases going forward that I'm unfamiliar with, um, we need to spend time doing the research behind it. and. Editors like you bringing those cases to us um, can point out some of the places that we need to look to help better understand what's going on. So my response is to when you're seeing those editors that are coming to you, I would encourage them to continue to come to you. And if you think that it needs to go towards additional processes, not just ARPCOM, but wherever it needs to go, um, bring it to us and we can start building those connections. Oh, oh, well, one thing that's important is right now, 
you know, the ARPCOM elections are coming up. And one thing ARPCOM really does need um, is people that don't just have a North American or Western European um, understanding of things. Because a lot of times we do deal with things from like India or other places where a lot of times uh, many of the arbitrators don't understand like the cultural norms there and why certain things happen. Um, for example, something might look suspicious because it's not something that, you know, someone in North America is used to, but it's not actually suspicious in that context. And that's something ARPCOM needs more of is that global view of things. So if you're interested, if you want to run for ARPCOM, please do. We need more perspectives on things and more a more rounded understanding of how editors and people in the, the world operate. So and that, I think that would also make it more accessible for people in minority communities if they see people in those minority communities on ARPCOM. What? One thing I'm especially sensitive to is that um, is that you, you know a lot of our anti abuse mechanisms, a lot of our anti abuse practices, end up falling hardest on uh, people outside the United States. Um, you know we uh, we have these really broad IP blocks, for example, IP range blocks, where uh, they're designed to prevent people from like using proxies to uh, circumvent other. Um, other other protection mechanisms, um, but it turns out that in there are a lot of countries that don't have very large IP block allocations, and so pretty much every single IP address in a lot of in a lot of countries. I'll caveat that based on what Kevin said. So because you're dealing with this right now in the Philippines, forty mm -hmm. percent of all IPs yeah. from one mobile phone provider yeah. are blocked because of vandalism, and the blocks are so broad that we have to. You know, they can't edit. If they want to edit anonymously, they cannot they either register or we have to create accounts for them because their blocks. Um, there are, there is collateral damage as a result of those very broad. Types. And, and just to clarify, that you're speaking as your experience as an admin on the Philippines wiki there. No, I'm oh, speaking as an admin on the my experience on the English okay. Wikipedia. Yeah. Ninety-five percent of all traffic from the Philippines to Wikipedia goes to English. Yeah. And, and, and you know these are these are I, it's a horrible user experience, right? Because you edit, you, you get this big red thing. Um, you know, you're like, well, shoot, I'm trying to volunteer my time for this website, um, and you want me to, you know, fill out this form and try to like backdoor my way into like not being blocked off this website when I've done nothing wrong. Like, I mean, talk about a you know 19th century user experience. But um, you, you know, I, I, and I think it's very true that if we uh, you know, there are some things we can. This is not like the, the this panel itself is not like a shining star of diversity, right? Like this, completely. You absolutely run for ARB comment. You know, I, I think down that path lies. You, you know, there's. Uh, it, I, it is. It's easier to you know have the sway to like push internal development in ways that perhaps are smarter on anti abuse mechanisms. More broadly, though, um, I think these are absolutely valid concerns and. Um, would love to talk afterwards about what we can do. All right. I think we have time for one last question. Like seriously editing, editing for about two years. I mostly edit in the area of um, local history, history about local minority groups. So I edit about like South Americans, which aren't Asian Americans, that's a certain example of Native Americans and like Somali Americans. Um, does ARPCOM deal with things like racism? I know that you said that you don't deal in content, but um, I'm always trying to understand how, because um, I often see racism either edited into content or like arguing and talking and stuff. And I'm always trying to understand how Wikipedia deals with content. Uh, we we look at the conduct that people are trying to put in place. So. Um, if, if it's blatant, usually it doesn't come to us because it has been so obvious that another admin is able to do that block. But if it's some things that are long-term systemic or um, a lot of racism comes from points of view that we choose and not choose to put onto the site and um, that editors want to put onto the site. And so we also look at what are the points of view that people keep trying to push and is it appropriate for them to be pushing as hard as they do um, and also trying to remove things that could be that should be valid within 
um, within the site. So we saw a lot of that with the Poland case um, that we had editors that were pushing certain points of view that lined with their own um, belief structures, and it was becoming disruptive, inappropriate, and was damaging a lot of really high quality articles. And so um, the arbitration committee stepped in and set boundaries. Um, and that's really a lot of what arbitrators, like that's a lot of what we do in the, in the end results, especially when we're talking about wider range um, responses, um, is that we are setting boundaries of how this content is going to go forward. Yeah. Um, and I think, yeah, yeah, when it comes to like, yeah, the way people um, act in contentious topic areas and such, uh, which can be like kind of, some of their viewpoints or some of like uh, things that do might be informed by a certain kind of, uh, you know, their extreme prejudices and stuff. Um, I can actually think of, um, I would say like some kind of recent um, examples where we kind of dealt with, I think, what was uh, some kind of discrimination on cases um, with the uh, small cat. are about to happen. And so you can really shape, oh, there we go. Uh, you can really shape the way that the arbitration committee functions in, if you think it's doing too much with what you heard about disinformation today, find some candidates who want to draw a firmer line on that. And if you think that there's more opportunity there, you can find candidates who, who are interested in doing even more work there. So I um, would really just say that uh, the committee elections really are a chance to truly shape um, how the committee goes. And so elections are coming up, so find good people to run. And so can we give the, a round of applause to our arbitrators for their time and perspective?